Right, welcome back everybody to episode 59 of the quantum science seminar, which today will be all about machine learning and application of classical machine learning to quantum technologies and quantum science. As usual, we would like to have your questions. Please send us your questions to quantum science seminar at gmail.com, or you can use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of your screen. Uh, as always, please also note that there's a 30 second time delay between what we do here and what you see is live on YouTube. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Oriol, who will introduce our speaker today. Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning for the viewers in the US and other parts of the world. So it's a great pleasure today to have uh, Florian Marker as a speaker. So I'll try to introduce uh, his CV. So Mark, uh, Florian is a theoretical physicist uh, doing research at the intersection between nanophysics and quantum optics. He studied physics in, the, in Bavaria, in the northern part of, of the region, in, in the city of Bayreuth. And in 2002, he defended his PhD at the University of Basel under the supervision of Professor uh, Bruda in Switzerland. Then he moved to the group of Steve Gerben uh, to do a postdoc at Yale University in the US and he stayed there around three years. He returned to Germany in 2005 uh, with an Emmy Noether uh, Research Junior Professor position at LMU in Munich. And after these five years, he became full professor at the University of Erlangen. And from uh, the summer of 2016, uh, Florian became director and scientific member of the Max Planck Institute of Science of Light in Erlangen. So the research spectrum of, of Florian is really broad. He has worked in many different topics, including optomechanics, quantum optics, decoherence, electronic transport in nanostructures, superconducting circuit, cavity quantum electrodynamics, non-equilibrium quantum many-body physics, classical nonlinear dynamics, and recently machine learning for physics. Uh, there are many highlights in, in his research. Uh, uh, most of us know uh, very, very famous reviews on cavity optomechanics and quantum noise that he has uh, written together with colleagues. He has provided a, a lot of ideas and theory input to, to many experiments in, in optomechanics. Uh, for instance, the famous uh, membrane in the middle experiments, uh, the quantum theory of cyber cooling, and also more uh, recent ideas on, on using, uh, on observing topological phases of sound and light and collective dynamics and optomechanical arrays. In addition to that, in the last years, he has been one of the pioneers in, in, in using classical machine learning, uh, machine learning for, for, for in physics uh, in general and in quantum physics in particular, and that's the topic of today's talk. And of course, all this research has been uh, awarded with many prizes and recognitions, such as, the, as I said before, the Eminator, uh, research Group Leader uh, Fellowship from the German Society Foundation, uh, the Walter Sch 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 Schottke Prize in 2009, and also the ERC starting run in 2011. So it's really a great pleasure to have you here. Furthermore, Florian is known to, to give very good talks and lectures, so it's really a privilege to have you here. So thank you very much, Florian, for accepting this, talk, uh, this invitation, and we look very much forward to your talk. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian and Oriol, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you. And uh, today I want to take you on a tour through a rapidly evolving topic, namely how to apply classical machine learning techniques to present day quantum technologies. I have been told that the audience is uh, rather diverse and also includes many students, so that means a good part of the talk will be rather didactic. So we start with an introduction to machine learning, especially modern techniques involving neural networks. And then I'll take you on an overview of machine learning for quantum technologies. So you get a glimpse of the many things that one can do. And then after that, I'll focus in a little bit more on a topic that is of particularly uh, high interest to us here, uh, which is called uh, deep reinforcement learning. I'll explain it as we go along. Then after this general tutorial part, uh, in the second half of the talk, I will focus on two examples from our own research. Uh, these deal with quantum error correction and quantum circuit optimization. So that's the general outline of the talk. And I think we discussed that after the first uh, tutorial introductory part, we will already have a question period. Fine. So let's get started. And let's talk a little bit about machine learning and neural networks. Consider your brain and consider it as an information processing device. 
So you see something and then you say something. There's input and there's output. Now, one of the marvelous things is that this is a very flexible and robust device. So if you see the picture of a light bulb that you have never seen before in this particular shape and perspective and color, you will still recognize it instantly in a fraction of a second. And the question is now, how can we build computers that have the same kind of robustness and flexibility? And it would really be very hard to come up with a handwritten algorithm, a hard-coded algorithm to achieve the same things as your brain. So that's a question, of course, that has been around for a long time, since more than half a century. And here's the answer that people came up with. It's called an artificial neural network. We will explain it in some more detail later, but it's certainly inspired. Even the name is inspired by uh, the neural networks inside your brain. And the idea here is that the algorithm or the structure of the neural network is extremely general and not at all domain specific or problem specific. What is problem specific is the large number of training examples that you use to change the setup of this artificial neural network during training. And so that would consist in showing many of these pictures, showing the correct corresponding label and slightly adjusting the internal details of the neural network in a manner that we will discuss just in a few moments. So that then gives you so-called artificial neural networks and they reach a performance, for example, an image recognition that is really on par or even better than what humans can do. And that came to the attention of a larger community in science and technology in 2012, because that was the first year when artificial neural networks were winning in one of those computer science competitions where the task was uh, to be able to recognize images after you have been shown many training examples. And since then, neural networks have always outperformed any other method in this domain. Now, it's no wonder then that since about this time, there has been a rapid proliferation of real world applications of artificial neural networks. They include image labeling, as just discussed, but also translation or speech recognition or things like colorizing a black and white movie. There's many different uh, applications. And once you are there, of course, it's only a small step to physics. So the first applications of neural networks in this recent rapid area of rapid developments, the first applications, not surprisingly, came about in the field of statistical physics. And I say it's not surprising because in statistical physics, if you look at the magnetization pattern in a material, for example, that is an image. And so it's not surprising that you can train a neural network to recognize, for example, a paramagnetic disordered phase from a ferromagnetic ordered phase. And then you can also use that same neural network to recognize where is the phase transition in between. You can use neural networks in many other areas of physics. You can go to quantum many body physics. You can use a neural network to represent a many body wave function in a compact and efficient way. You can use neural networks to study dynamical systems. For example, you could learn the right hand side of a dynamical equation that at least approximately describes your system of particles that you're studying. You can do experimental data analysis. You can train a neural network to discover the parameters of your physical system from some noisy measurement traces that you have acquired. And there are many other examples that we are going to discuss. So how does this work? How does a neural network work? And I'm sure many of you know, but then there's a good fraction of you who are students who don't yet know, so bear with me. It is a neural network. It consists of neurons represented by circles. And in contrast to a biological neural network, each of these neurons only holds a single value, a single number at any given time. So it's something very simple. Then these neurons are connected, just like in your brain. And this neural network in particular is ordered in terms of layers of neurons. The idea being that you will feed in the data at the bottom of the neural network and then go through a sequence of processing steps to obtain the output of the neural network. Let me just briefly comment on the elementary step in this computational sequence. So suppose you look at something very simple. You have one output neuron, which 
has a value y that we're going to compute and to input neurons in a lower layer with values y1 and y2. So there are connections between all these neurons and our task will be if we already know the values of the neurons in the lower layer to get the values in the higher layer. Now there is just two simple steps to do this. First, there's a linear step. So we take a linear superposition of the neuron values in the lower layer and that we would call Z. This alone would not yet be complex enough to give you all the power that neural networks have. So following this linear step, you apply a nonlinear so-called activation function, which can be a rather simple looking function. For example, here, F of Z is just rising slowly from zero to one, a smooth step function. And that you apply to your linear superposition in order to finally get the output value for the neuron value Y. So that's what happens in an elementary step. Now this happens not only for two input neurons, but for many. So there will be many more weights, that is the connection strengths. And there of course will also be many more neurons in the upper layer. And then you not only do it for one layer, but for many. So that's the whole secret. You write in the input of the neural network in the lowest layer. And the input could be the values that describe an image. Then you use the step that I just discussed to calculate all the neuron values in the next layer. You go one step further and finally, eventually you arrive at the output layer. Now, in the beginning, before you have trained your neural network, what you get at the output will just be complete nonsense. So obviously it has nothing to do with the task you wanted to solve. And so the question comes up, how do we actually train such a neural network? How do we make sure that eventually after training, it gives the desired results? And the basic idea I already introduced before, you have lots of training examples where you have input output pairs where you know what is the correct output. So we could now imagine if we don't quite get the correct output, that we tentatively change one of the weights, one of the connection strengths, we see what happens to the neuron values further upstream and eventually what happens to the output neuron values. Now we compare this against the desired output. Have we come closer to the desired output is the question. If yes, we keep this weight change. If no, of course, we have to change in the opposite direction. So that's the essence of training a neural network, looking at many input output examples and trying to change all the weights inside the neural network that determine the connection strengths in order to come closer to the desired outputs. And this is done in a highly efficient manner. So you can do gradient descent uh, on the deviation between desired output and actual output. And you can calculate the gradients with respect to all the parameters in the neural network in an extremely efficient manner by a technique that is called backpropagation. So in a nutshell, this is behind the success of neural networks, training and an efficient way to do the training. Now, when you first get into this business, you get very excited because it seems the sky is the limit and everything is possible, but uh, I should warn you a little bit. So machine learning is not a magic bullet as it were. So first of all, training a neural network is really a highly nonlinear and stochastic process. The neural network itself is nonlinear and the training examples you pick from your large data set, these are stochastically picked. And this process is not well understood theoretically. Actually, there are statistical physicists who devote their research to exactly this question. Then also the results of the training, they depend very heavily on the quantity and the quality of the training data. So if you can only provide me with 100 images, let's say for the training, presumably that will not be enough. And that can be a challenge for some science applications. Also, even if the neural network that is trained really works very well, that doesn't mean that you now understand your physics problem. So having a well-trained neural network is not really a substitute for basic understanding. And then finally, even if everything works well and you have acquired some basic understanding by um, looking at some small toy models, still you want to interpret what the neural network is doing. This is particularly important when the applications of the neural network become very critical. So you want to interpret what's going on and that really requires care and is actually also a, a research subject in its own right. But nevertheless, neural networks are very useful and they can be fun. And so we should just go ahead and study them and see uh, what we can do with them. So that's my point of view. Fine. So let's 
go on and have a look more specifically at how you could use techniques of machine learning, and neural networks are a big part of modern machine learning, how you could use these tools in an area that is of interest to all of us here, namely quantum technologies. So for example, here I'm showing a picture of a superconducting microwave uh, circuit uh, that you might want to control uh, using a neural network. And I should say in this brief survey, the point of the survey is rather to give you some ideas of what is possible. This is not really a review that is comprehensive in any way. For that, I would refer you to the literature. Now, if we talk quantum systems, we will probably also talk observations, that is measurements. And then the question is, what can you do with these observations if you think in terms of machine learning? So the first step would certainly be to interpret the observations. You could, for example, ask yourself, well, given these few measurement results, what quantum state am I dealing with? And here machine learning can help to look at the statistics and try to extract the quantum state. You could also say, well, given these few measurement results, what do I think are the underlying parameters of the, my model? For example, the Hamiltonian of my system. I have fabricated it, but maybe it's not quite what I think it is. Can I extract those? And again, machine learning can help. And then after you've performed these first, few steps, you could go on and you could say, well, how do I control my quantum system by feeding back on the measurements and uh, achieving a certain task that I set out to do? Or I could say my measurements are not yet sufficient. I have not yet acquired enough information. And maybe I can choose in a clever way what to measure next. So I could do adaptive measurements to gain as much information as possible. So for all of these things, machine learning can help. And then once you are happy with uh, using machine learning for these tasks, there's a very important question that comes up. Namely, do we train on simulations or do we train on real experiments? And you can imagine that this makes a big, big difference. Um, training on real experiments uh, has its own challenges, just technical challenges, maybe the speed of the data transfer and so on. But it can have its benefits because um, you don't need to do an exponentially difficult simulation of a many body quantum system, or you can already uh, take into account by your machine learning techniques all the distortions and noise that are added to the signal. So, uh, let me give you a few examples of what people have done and what you can do uh, in terms of applying machine learning to quantum technologies. Let's start simple. Let's talk about readout. So here's a typical readout trajectory. This could be the uh, current, the electrical current through some device or the intensity of a light beam or microwave beam transmitted through a cavity. And it's somehow sensitive to the state of a qubit. So what happens here is this noisy signal trace suddenly jumps. That would be a transition from qubit state one to zero. And what you could try to do is you could try to train a neural network on many such uh, uh, realizations of such uh, stochastic trajectories in order to give you predictions of which quantum state you really are looking at. And the benefit of doing that as opposed to other techniques would be that if there are any systematic distortions in the data or some funny noise sources that you may not even be able to model accurately, the neural network, if done properly, will actually learn automatically on the fly to take care of all these noise sources, even if things are non-linearly distorted in some way. And so this uh, was shown in a very nice experiment, actually already a few years ago in the uh, Berkeley group of um, uh, Siddiqui. What you see here in the upper part is a voltage trace in a readout of a superconducting qubit. It has very strong fluctuations, of course, versus time. And then they trained a neural network to predict as well as possible what is the quantum state of the qubit given these noisy measurement traces. So the way that worked was they prepared the qubit, they measured the qubit after some time, and then they compared the actual measurement result against the statistics predicted uh, by the neural network, and they uh, trained the neural network on many such runs, and eventually it became quite good at extracting from these noisy measurement traces, the actual time evolving state of the driven qubit. So very nice experiment. 
Now we can get more ambitious. This was a single qubit. We can also think ahead in terms of say quantum computing, many physical qubits that try to make up one logical qubit. And we're using some uh, known quantum error correction code like the surface code. And then one of the subtasks we have to solve is by measuring individual physical qubits or doing collective measurements on physical qubits, we want to figure out whether an error has happened and if necessary, we want to correct it. So in surface code, you have the syndrome measurement and then you need to uh, guess what was the underlying error in order to be able to correct it. And there has been a number of interesting theoretical works uh, trying to train a neural network on this task. And again, this is a very flexible method. While there are other methods in existence, if you have, let's say, a more complicated setup or maybe the noise properties are a little bit funny, then the neural network will automatically adapt to that. So that's the great thing. Now, going from these cases where we have a single or many qubits and we just perform a given measurement and then try to interpret it, we can also switch to the interesting domain of adaptive measurements. So there we have under our control also which measurement we're trying to do. So a simple example would be a single qubit, but we have many copies of it and we don't know its quantum state. We start measuring along a certain basis and then as the measurement results are coming in, we're trying to adapt our basis, maybe measuring along a different direction in order to gain as much information as possible. And so this is something that actually the group of uh, Barry Sanders uh, started quite some time ago. It's a very complicated problem because there is, so to speak, all the measurement strategies are really represented by trees like the one shown here. Given all the sequence of measurement results that you have observed so far, what should be your next choice of measurement basis? So it's a really high dimensional optimization task. And more recently, so this was done first, uh, even without neural networks, with other machine learning optimization techniques. And more recently, people have also uh, used neural networks for this kind of task. So that's adaptive measurements. Then here, another uh, nice example, uh, going to quantum many body systems. If you have a few measurement results in a quantum many body system, like these atoms arranged in a string of atoms in a trap, uh, then you get some statistics, but you want to guess what is the underlying many body quantum uh, wave function. That's a non trivial task. And so you need a neural network that is able to represent quantum many body states and is trying to reproduce as well as possible the observed statistics. And once it has been trained on the observed statistics, hopefully it will also give good predictions for other statistics that you could be interested in. And actually that, uh, uh, that has been quite successful also in real experiments already. Okay, so moving on from looking at quantum states to looking at Hamiltonians. So you have built your quantum device, but you're not quite sure what is the Hamiltonian. There are fabrication intolerances. Or you have an actual quantum system that occurs naturally and you want to figure out the Hamiltonian. How to do that best? And so what you could do is you, again, this is a case of adaptive measurements only in a slightly different setting where now instead of an unknown quantum state, you have unknown parameters in your Hamiltonian and you would try to choose measurement parameters like pulse strengths and so on or measurement basis in order to find out as much as possible from the measurement results about the underlying parameters of the Hamiltonian. Then you would update your knowledge about these parameters, maybe in a Bayes way uh, to, to shrink the probability distribution to a smaller interval, and then you would uh, choose the next measurement that can give you the maximum amount of information. And so um, that has been also explored already in a few pioneering works, but I'm sure there's still lots and lots to be done. So here a very, very early work comes from the group of Natalia Ares at Oxford. She is a quantum dot experimentalist and she used machine learning techniques to ask where should I place my voltages for my quantum dot setup and measure the electric current in order to get the most information about the unknown underlying parameters of my quantum dot. So very, very nice work. Here's another work from the Bristol group. There they had a very funny hybrid setup where on the one hand you have your NV center, but you don't know all its detailed properties. You try to measure it, and then you want to try to compare the measurement 
against a model where you can still adapt the parameters in order to come as close as possible to the observed measurement results. And in this way, you will find out what are the actual underlying parameters of the NBE center. But instead of running the model on a computer simulation, they had their own quantum photonic simulator, uh, which did the simulation for them. Of course, maybe it was not quite needed here for an NB center, but you can easily imagine that in the future, you extend this to more complicated setups to many body systems where it would be quite out of the question to do a, a reliable and fast uh, simulation on a, on a classical computer, but you could do it uh, using your quantum simulator. So moving from unknown setups to inventing setups, the idea uh, is if we are into quantum technologies and we have a certain target like producing highly entangled states or doing some kind of state transformation, uh, can we invent uh, setups out of very simple components that would be optimal for this kind of task? And so there's a very beautiful line of work that was started by uh, Mario Gren and uh, back then in the group of uh, Anton Seilinger, uh, trying to do this exactly in the domain of quantum optics. So you would put together many beam splitters and um, uh, phase shifters and nonlinear devices. And you ask yourself, can I optimize the amount of entanglement that I get for the photonic states that come out of this kind of setup? And again, this was even started as an optimization problem and later people tried to apply the whole machinery of say deep neural networks to this problem. So that reminds us that machine learning, the whole field of machine learning is actually much wider than just neural networks. Okay, good. And so then uh, coming to um, something that will form the backdrop of the remainder of the talk, Let's talk a little bit about quantum control and feedback. So you have your uh, system, maybe it's already well characterized and you build it in an optimal fashion, but you want to control it. You want to control it maybe with some control pulses coming down your microwave lines and you want to do that in an optimal fashion. Now, this problem is of course much older than uh, say recent uh, applications of deep neural networks, but it is obviously a very well suited problem. And just to set the stage, we have to distinguish between the case where we don't have feedback, open loop control, and the case where we do have feedback, closed loop control. And the typical tasks that you could envisage for this case would be state preparation, synthesis, synthesis of unitary gates, uh, state stabilization, quantum error correction using feedback, um, feedback cooling, things like that. Now, traditionally, this has been already the domain of numerical techniques because it's quite hard to do anything here analytically. But these were numerical techniques like uh, GRAPE that quite directly do gradient descent on the parameters of the control pulses. And what I want to focus on a little bit more here is uh, how the new machine learning techniques come in. So they have several advantages and I come back to that in a moment. They can be model free. So they can implicitly learn a model from the behavior that you observe, for example, in an experiment. And um, one of the good things is you can then easily incorporate feedback. And also you can always exploit the most recent developments in the field of computer science. So they can come in for free, so to speak, in order to enhance anything you do in this domain. Okay, so just to give a few examples to start with this topic. Um, the first things you can do is I have one or two qubits. I want to apply control pulses to these qubits to prepare a state or to implement a unitary. And here's a couple of earlier references that I uh, will um, recommend to you. At this point, I will also point out that um, there is a connection to the whole field of quantum machine learning. I, I'm today not talking about quantum machine learning, but among the many meanings of the word quantum machine learning, there is also simply that you will have a parameterized quantum circuit that represents something like a gate sequence. And then you're trying to optimize the continuous parameters inside this quantum circuit 
to achieve a certain task. And so that's very close and spiritual uh, techniques that have been applied uh, on the uh, on classical computers like grape for quantum control. Okay. So now uh, with that, I finish the little overview that I promised about recent applications of machine learning in the domain of quantum technologies. And now I want to start to focus a little bit more, but the first part is still a didactic part. And I would suggest that we take questions after this first uh, part for the next five minutes or so. Okay, so what I want to focus on now is a subdomain of uh, machine learning called reinforcement learning. And especially if it's done with deep neural networks, it's called deep reinforcement learning. So what is this about? You have to realize that most studies of neural networks fall into the domain of so-called supervised learning. This is what I explained in the beginning. You have training examples, you have input, and you already know what is the correct output. And that is similar to having a teacher who is very smart explain to a student many, many examples where the answers to the questions are already known. And eventually the student will imitate the teacher and hopefully be able to slightly extrapolate from these examples. But the catch or the downside is that this student will probably never get much better than the teacher. And so that's a little bit disappointing, maybe, if you want to do science or if you want to have a really good student, you want to have a situation where the student or the scientist becomes better and better and even better than any teacher who has been there in the beginning. And that can happen if, so how is that supposed to happen, you ask? And that can happen if you just try out things and you see what works. And whatever works, you keep and then you modify it a little bit and maybe it works even better and then you keep doing that. So that would be the domain of what we call reinforcement learning. You are reinforcing the good behavior. And uh, I guess some of you or even many of you know from the headlines one really remarkable result that falls into this category of reinforcement learning, which was AlphaGo, where deep reinforcement learning was used to have the computer uh, train to play the game of Go, and eventually it was better than the best human players in the world, even though the game of Go has exponentially many configurations, so it was considered to be an extremely hard challenge for a computer to solve. So how does this work? There are actually several approaches to reinforcement learning. There are two big classes of approaches. And for brevity, let me just explain one of them so you get an impression of what is going on. When we talk about reinforcement learning, we divide everything into an environment, which is, so to speak, the world around you, and an agent who is trying to do something inside this environment. And the usual a sequence of events would be that the agent takes an observation of the environment that is that has an observed state. It then tries to translate that observed state into an action, and it will apply this action, which will change the state of the environment. And there's the next observation, and so on and so on. So we have the sequence of events where we observe, observe states, pick actions, and get rewards. Now, um, in this way of describing reinforcement learning, you would say that you want to map states to actions, and you could decide to express this so-called policy in a probabilistic manner. So pi is the probability to take action A given some observed state S. And I already sneaked in a parameter theta into this policy, because of course, when we are training, when we are learning, we want to change this policy in order to get rewards that become higher and higher. So that's the setting, that is the setting of uh, reinforcement learning. And just to illustrate that the underlying mathematics is actually not that difficult, here is the basic formula of this big branch of reinforcement learning that's called policy gradient. We are looking at the total sum of rewards, and we're simply taking the uh, gradient of these rewards with respect to the parameters of the policy, and then we're doing gradient ascent. So we are changing parameters continuously in order to get ever higher 
uh, sum of rewards. And if you work it out, you will then find, oh, you get an expectation value over gradients of the policy averaged over trajectories. All of this is probabilistic. So you have to run many trajectories, try out many sequences of actions, and then average over all of them and see uh, how you would have to change your parameters in order to get better. So the good, so, so you see these are quite old techniques and the uh, real breakthroughs came in recent years when uh, these techniques were combined with deep neural networks because they are able to deal with high dimensional data. For example, high dimensional observations, you have a full image as the state observation and that's what you want to base your action on. Okay, and so quickly to sum up this general outline of reinforcement learning, what are the advantages? And then I will say so, something about disadvantages as well. So what are the advantages of reinforcement learning? So first of all, if you, you have a variety of other more classical techniques like GRAPE, but they often don't very well do feedback. And so here feedback is an essential component because there's this loop of observations and then actions decided based on the observations. And this is very important because if you look at the computational complexity of the problem, having feedback drastically increases the search space of strategies. So if A is your number of actions and N is the number of time steps, uh, simply because um, you have to invent a good action for each sequence of previous measurement results. And so you have a double exponential increase of the number of strategies if you do have feedback. So you need some efficient technique to deal with this. And then the other part I already mentioned briefly, these reinforcement learning techniques, they are model free. They are treating the environment as a black box. They pretend they don't know what's going on. And all of these techniques work without without knowing what's going on in the environment, which is of course important for a robot because the environment is the real world. You don't have a precise model, but it's even very useful for quantum devices because there may be noise or there may be components of the quantum device you don't know exactly. And so there's no need to first calibrate your model or develop a fit to the model equations. You can eventually learn on real devices with all their imperfections. Another advantage is you can handle arbitrary observations. So I already mentioned deep reinforcement learning can really use images at, as input. You could use whole videos, you could use measurement trajectories of any kind. You could use sentences uh, that are sequences of words. You could use graphs, if you like, that represent something. You could use quantum states as input, or you could use full quantum circuits, as we will see later as input to your neural network in order to decide on the next action. So that's very powerful. There are, of course, challenges. And so one of the challenges is in order for what I described to work, you need to have good statistics. You need to see many, many, many evolutions and record the rewards. And eventually you learn which parameter changes would increase the rewards. So there's maybe tens of thousands of evolutions that you have to see. And that may be a problem in some practical applications. If you have a robot uh, running into a wall for 10,000 times, it's not good. And then uh, also you can, uh, cannot easily discover strategies that rely totally on a very rare event. So if there's only one very rare sequence of actions that finally gives you a reward and everything else is not rewarded, uh, then that is a case where basically even reinforcement learning is not really better than brute force search and brute force search in such a case is already um, exponentially complicated. Okay, so um, this is where I want to stop for questions because then the second half will be when I give you two examples out of our own research. Yeah, thank you very much Florian already for this very nice uh, introduction and overview. So we indeed have a lot of questions. So we will try to ask uh, uh, some, most of them now. And if there are some left, we will keep them for the, for the end of the talk. So let's start from a very uh, high level type of question. So um, how relevant is the question of energy consumption in machine learning? Uh, brains uh, seem to be very efficient as compared to computers. 
Okay, that's an extremely good question. And sometimes I have a bad conscience when I look at the electricity bill of our cluster where these things are running, because you can easily go overboard, of course. Um, so it is a problem. And it's a problem that physicists are now trying to address uh, by inventing optimized hardware platforms that uh, rely more on physical systems. So the idea would be to, for example, run parts of uh, what you need for such a neural network on a photonic circuit. And there's even companies out now that are trying to build these uh, where the energy consumption is really much, much lower and the uh, speed is uh, also much higher. Um, this is not yet mainstream, uh, obviously. Uh, also, these uh, solutions so far uh, sometimes are only partial solutions. For example, you do all the matrix vector multiplications that you need inside a neural network. You, you do them on the photonic circuit, but you don't yet do the nonlinearities. We ourselves have some ideas of how you could do everything together, uh, but it remains to be seen uh, how good that will work. So yes, energy consumption is an issue, um, especially when people do, uh, for example, so-called hyperparameter searches by which we mean um, there are questions like, okay, how is the structure of my neural network? How many neurons do I have? Uh, when I do my learning, how big should be the learning steps? Um, and these things are typically optimized by people running <laughs> several times for different configurations and different parameters. And of course that eats uh, a lot of the energy. So yeah, so it's, it's a problem. <laughs> Thank you. So you mentioned it a bit at the end that uh, it seems very important to, to how you train the, the neural network. And this sometimes might be a complex problem itself. So could, could one think about using a neural network to train another one? Uh, so there are people, so that comes a little bit to what I just discussed, because you can also say, okay, what exactly should be my learning strategy? Also, what's the structure of the neural network? Um, People have done various optimization approaches, also including genetic algorithm, but uh, there have also already been people uh, using, as you suggested, as you mentioned, uh, another neural networks to look at how we could optimize the training of neural networks. I wouldn't have uh, references off the top of my head, but people have done such a thing. And moving now into the context of using neural networks for physics, um, you mentioned that machine learning can be used to analyze experimental data, but here it often seems like this is not such a good idea because you cannot control systematic errors from the training procedure and so on. So what's your take on understanding and quantifying such systematics so that the physicist could confidentially quote an error bar for the output of a, of a neural network? Okay, that's a very good question. So the, the standard way this would be done is, of course, you have a kind of, you first have your training set. Uh, let's uh, go back to this very nice and clear example here. You have your training set. You know how you prepare your states. You know what your measurement results give. Uh, you train your neural network. And then you have a validation set where you have actually measured the state, but you, of course, don't tell it to the neural network. And so that can give you some, uh, some understanding of the errors. Um, this neural network will automatically, as I said, take into account all funny kinds of systematic shifts and distortions and so on in, in making the best predictions it can do. But there would be certain things that it cannot know about, for example, if your preparation sequence is already wrong and you think you prepare one state, but actually you do some other state and you weren't even able to get rid of that, even despite some say calibration measurements that you did, then of course the neural network has no chance. And also you will not have a chance later to, to understand this because you're already starting from the wrong assumptions. So um, that's a little bit tricky. In the future, of course, if you think of adaptive measurements, there could be ways out of that because um, what could happen is that the neural network keeps an open mind as to that, well, the preparation could be slightly wrong, the measurement could be wrong, the assumptions about anything else could be wrong. And then it would maybe do, it would, like a good scientist, it would see small anomalies 
and then it would say, oh, I have to focus on these anomalies. And then it would do other measurements that, uh, that zoom into these anomalies and try to maximize these anomalies in order to figure out, wait, uh, my preparation was actually wrong. That's still quite a bit in the future. But if we give a lot of power of different actions uh, for the network, then it could uh, actually, the neural network itself could become the tool to uncover such uh, systematic errors. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned that uh, neural networks are, of course, not just a magic uh, tool. There is no free lunch. So once you want to apply it, uh, apply neural networks for a given problem, uh, how, how do you do that? So how do you do? How do you design a, an appropriate neural network? Is this just based on experience, or is there a systematic uh, construction method? Okay. So the uh, the first thing is uh, you have to be clear about what is your goal, and it's easiest in supervised problems where you say, okay, this is the input I have. The good thing about neural networks is they are very forgiving. If you change the format of your input or so, they they can deal with anything after training. And then you also have to say, this is the output I would desire. And also, this is how I want to punish or reward my neural network uh, as to whether it's getting the, the correct output or not. So for example, which pieces of the output are more important to me? So I want to get them right to a very high degree of precision and which are less important. So this is the first question you have to ask yourself, input and output. And then uh, we find that for the structure of the neural network, there are some simple things like you sometimes can exploit symmetries. For example, your input is an image, there's translational symmetry, you know immediately, aha, convolutional neural networks. So there's a certain type of neural networks that you want to apply. Or you say, oh, my input looks like a graph. So there are graph neural networks. Um, but apart from that, um, I would say, mm, if the problem is suited for machine learning, then you should already get re decent results with the first attempt of a few layer neural network maybe, and then you can tinker with it. But uh, it would be very rare that uh, the, these first attempts completely fail, even though the problem in principle is suitable and there would be a much better solution. So, so these neural networks to some degree are fairly robust. That's, that's my experience. Okay. And it, maybe a bit related to, to the previous question. So how, how does one prevent overfeeding? Uh, what are the best practices here? Uh, okay, yes. So just to explain for everyone else, you can see, of course, neural networks as a kind of high dimensional fitting procedure. You have input uh, and output. Let's like X and F of X. You want to fit this high dimensional function. And um, it depends now a little bit on how your data is generated. Let's say you have just 1,000 measurement points, that's your data, that's all you have to work with, or 1,000 images, and you know the correct labels. And then if you train the neural network, you go through these images again and again and again. And then at some point, there's the danger that the network will memorize the correct answers. And instead of having understood the general feature of an image that shows a cat, it will just have memorized, oh, these three images, where in the background I see a tree or a house or a street, these are my cat images. And that, of course, is not what you want. Um, so then um, the first thing is you will be able to recognize this by testing the neural network on data it has never seen before. So that's why you always hold back a little bit of test data. Um, and then there are ways to prevent it. So the easiest way would be to stop the training if your test results get worse. So that's one easy way. The other uh, very um, convenient method is to inject noise. It's called dropout. You just inject noise into the neural network and it turns out that then it cannot focus in on very unimportant details simply because there's so much noise and it concentrates more on the essence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is a question regarding, uh, well, uh, from the understanding of this introduction, it seems that there are two types of problems. Let's say those in which one tries to certify or unveil parameters in the model, such as in performing, for instance, demography, and others that are more creative and can generate solutions to difficult problems. I think that's what you refer to as predicting versus inventing. If so, it seems somehow that the inventing type of problems um, are more relevant. Uh, would you agree with that? And if so, are, 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 also they, are, are they also more challenging? And, and in which sense? Well, OK. So let's say if you can make one of the inventing kinds of problems work, of course, that's more exciting. 
I would say for practical day-to-day -day work in quantum technologies, these more simple, in a quotation marks, uh, supervised approaches where you want to do state extractions, I think they are highly relevant. And that's also where you get lots of data. So the more inventive or exploratory approaches, uh, they are, of course, extremely interesting. And there's many different aspects. And here's just one aspect uh, I want to mention. So if, if your computer... If you have your uh, if you have your computer algorithm and it optimizes something and it has uh, presented to you a solution which you find quite kind of interesting, then there arises the question: Okay, is this a really novel solution? And of course, this is something that the computer itself cannot know because at least at the moment the computer itself does not have an overview over the scientific literature. Maybe we will have that in the future, but at the moment, no. So in order then to convince your colleagues. When you publish the paper that this is really a new solution having been invented by a neural network or by a machine learning uh, tool uh, you need to be the expert or at least you need to collaborate with experts that can plausibly have an overview of the scientific literature and argue that this particular even type of solution hasn't been found uh, previously so that there's still a quite significant uh, human component in there Maybe at, uh, at least for some time being, we will have a kind of hybrid uh, human computer team approach uh, to tackle these problems. Okay. That's good. Uh, Florian, there are a couple of more questions, but not to cut too much the flow of the talk. I suggest that we continue now, if that's okay with you, and maybe uh, okay. later on we, we ask this yes. of questions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, very good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very good questions anyway. So, okay, so we went through this overview and then we looked at uh, deep reinforcement learning. And now I want to give you two examples from our own research of the past years uh, where we have applied deep reinforcement learning in the field of quantum technology. And the first one is uh, the paper that we actually started with in this field. It was the, to our knowledge, the first uh, application of deep reinforcement learning uh, to quantum feedback. And uh, that was about discovering quantum error correction strategies. So to give the overall setting, we know, of course, that quantum computers are very fragile. Uh, so they will lose the quantum information due to noise sources. And since the 90s, people have been studying various approaches to counter this. And these approaches come in various uh, shapes and are living on different conceptual levels. So there's the more, say, general, but also slightly more abstract approaches uh, here denoted by stabilizer codes. This is what Shaw started and uh, then also incorporates the surface code. And then there are some other approaches that are more hardware specific, where, for example, you do some dynamical decoupling sequences or you uh, encounter decoherence-free subspaces that depend on the details of the noise. And so the question is, if you now have a particular hardware platform, quantum hardware platform for your quantum computer, um, maybe you don't know which of these approaches will work. Maybe it's even a combination of these approaches. And so the question is, can you have a general scheme that will tell you for a particular uh, hardware platform, what would be the best uh, quantum error correction scheme for that platform? And so this is where we thought reinforcement learning can happen. And so to make it very concrete, here's the setting. We have a few qubits, a small quantum module, and we want to protect it against noise. At the moment, we are only talking not even about quantum computation, just quantum memory. So we want to preserve the quantum information. And to place this into the setting of reinforcement learning, we would consider the quantum computer, this little quantum module together with its noise, we would consider it as the reinforcement learning environment. And then it will uh, be acted upon by an agent. The agent can measure things. It can decide to impose one qubit gates or two qubit gates onto this little uh, quantum device. Now, here's the rules of the game. Suppose I initialize one of the physical qubits with a superposition state, an arbitrary superposition state, and our aim in the end will be to preserve the quantum information contained in the state for as long as possible against the noise. 
We all know, of course, since the work of Shaw, that it might be useful to generate some entanglement between the qubits and do something smart with a measurement. So we want to have these possibilities. Our agent should be able to do these things. And now in order to display what's going on, I'm drawing a quantum circuit in the usual manner. So the time runs to the right. Each line represents a single qubit. One of the qubits has been initialized in this quantum state. Now, if you don't know what to do, you could just randomly try out stuff, including doing a few C0 gates and then maybe measuring one of your qubits. The problem is if you know your quantum physics a little bit, you would realize that this sequence is particularly bad because it collapses the quantum state. So it's re really even worse than the noise that is acting on your qubits. And that is the situation that a uh, reinforcement learning agent faces at the beginning of training. It just has a number of different actions that it can perform like these C naughts or measurements or bit flips, but it does not know at all what to do in order to preserve the quantum information. And then you start the training. And so in order to illustrate what's uh, going to happen during the training, here I have the simplest possible example, just four qubits. We can measure any of them. We can have controlled knots between any of them. And we have some kind of noise, for example, bit flip noise acting on these qubits. And the goal again is to preserve the quantum information. Now, here's what happens during training. So I'm showing quantum circuits that have been generated by the reinforcement learning agent where the uh, sequence of actions is just a sequence of gates acting on these four qubits. And the uppermost trace is uh, basically at the start of training. So it's more or less random. It's very bad, the quantum information collapses. But then after a larger number of um, training epochs, uh, the neural network becomes better and it has learned some features that it should obey and eventually it becomes really good. So first it avoids catastrophic measurements, then it finds actually an encoding that produces a state that we with our knowledge, uh, having read say Shor's paper, uh, know is the famous repetition code. And then it discovers parity detection. So collective measurements that are good in order to not collapse the quantum state and it applies them periodically in the sequence uh, shown down here. And it has set aside one of the qubits as an ancilla qubit for these uh, collective measurements. Okay, so that's what it learns. And if you want to quantify the training progress, here's a quantity that we introduce to measure the amount of quantum information that is still there. And it increases over time. And you can identify different stages, qualitative stages, where the network really learns something qualitatively new. And eventually it ends up even finding good adaptive um, error correction strategies. So where having discovered there is an error, it knows what to do in order to fix the error. And it depends on exactly what it observes. And once this works for a simple setup, you can use exactly the same strategy to train on different setups. So this is shown here. Maybe the connectivity is different. Maybe you can measure only at one point in the chain as opposed to at every point in the chain and so on. And you could also think of different uh, control gates, et cetera. And so what you're seeing here is this different strategies that the neural network discovers for all these different topologies of the little uh, quantum device. And what is highlighted by red are these adaptive uh, sequences. So when a measurement indicates that something funny has happened, so there has been an error, uh, then the neural network uh, knows what to do in order to figure out where exactly the error has happened and what to do in order to fix it. And so then you can quantify this and you will find, for example, that the uh, effective decoherence time after the neural network has acted um, will depend, of course, on the, on the topology of your quantum device. Okay. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's always some version of stabilizer codes that the neural network figures out for this particular uh, hardware platforms. It can also discover quite different strategies. So here's an example where um, we have three qubits. They are all acted upon by the same kind of global noise. Think of a globally fluctuating magnetic field. And then the agent actually discovers that the best strategy is to take two of these qubits as a kind of a calibration device in order to 
figure out uh, the properties of the noise uh, so that you can correct what's going on on the other qubit. And it uh, figures out an adaptive strategy even to do this. Okay, and so just to finish this up, um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that you just take any of the computer science reinforcement learning approaches out of the box, off the shelf, you apply it, and then you're done. This is certainly not what happened. This would get stuck even for this problem. And so we had to put in a little bit of our human thinking of our domain knowledge into this problem. So first we constructed a smart reward function that is smarter than just telling the network at the very end whether the state has collapsed or is still living. And I invite you to go to our paper to learn about this. And then we invented another technique that we call two-stage learning. So what this is about is we found that instead of feeding and measurement results, the network much more easily learns a good strategy if we feed in the full quantum state at each point in time. Now, of course, this is somewhat unrealistic. It's powerful, but unrealistic because in a real experiment, you do not have access to the quantum state. And so what you can do then is a general trick. You can take this network, which has discovered a very good strategy, and then you can take it as a teacher for a second network that only has the measurement results available and which tries to mimic, nevertheless, the actions of this more powerful network, which now acts as a teacher. And this works surprisingly well. And then the second network could actually be deployed on a real experiment. And so, um, yeah, let me just end this section by saying the main advantage of applying such a reinforcement learning approach is really its flexibility, because now you could move to other platforms, let's say, introduce cavities on top of qubits, or if you think of iron traps, there are other actions that are not even unitary gates, but shuffling around the, uh, the qubits inside the iron trap would be another kind of action. And so while we are not yet there, so this is an ambitious research program, and we are just only now taking the first steps uh, there, um, there has been some activity in the experimental uh, community uh, towards uh, using deep reinforcement learning on actual experimental platforms. And here's a very nice example, very recent example, um, where they optimized control pulses. So no feedback yet, but optimized control pulses for superconducting quantum processes. Okay. Now in the last uh, 10 minutes, if that's allowed, uh, I still want to talk about um, another very recent work of ours, and that's about quantum circuit optimization. So you saw an obvious catch of what I explained to you previously, which was that we needed to simulate on a classical computer, at least in the present version, we needed to simulate our little quantum module and what is the effect of this uh, gate sequence. And that means we cannot easily scale up. Maybe there are then uh, uh, adaptations of this uh, approach, but at the present, we cannot easily scale up beyond say 10 qubits or so. Now that maybe is not enough for the applications you have in mind. And in particular, if you're thinking of these noisy intermediate scale quantum devices that maybe have 50 qubits. And what I'm discussing now is some strategy that will work for these devices because it uh, can work without actually simulating these devices. And the goal we set ourselves is quantum circuit optimization. So you have a quantum circuit a gate, sequence of gates like the one shown here, but you want to make it as compact as possible. This is particularly important if instead of five qubits, you have 50 qubits and many, many gates, and you're dealing with these noisy devices which do not yet have um, logical qubits which are fully error protected. So there's a lot of noise going on and you need to work closely on the hardware level to minimize the number of gates that you have and also maybe the number of qubits that you are using. How can you do this? Well, the goal would be that you take this quantum circuit and you know already that it performs the unitary uh, that you want it to have because it is a direct translation of some quantum circuit that you want to implement. And then instead of trying to come up with equivalent quantum circuits from scratch, trying out many different sequences of uh, gates, what you do is something a little bit different. What you do is you recognize that there are certain transformations where you say interchange gates or replace them with other gates that are leaving the whole circuit invariant. So 
the unitary that the circuit represents is still the same unitary as before. If you can be sure of that, then of course you can go ahead and apply any of these transformations. And if they happen to shrink the circuit, this is what you want. And you don't need to simulate the whole uh, unitary for that purpose. So this is the approach we're going to take. And now you already see where this is going because if there's many different transformations that I could apply, but I don't know which ones are the best ones, uh, this is the case for reinforcement learning. And so as an overview, we would have an original circuit, we want to optimize it to get an equivalent, more efficient circuit. And so what we need is then some representation of the quantum circuit that's observed by a neural network, which suggests a transformation, and then we uh, continue the loop. Now, uh, just a few words about this actually works because all of these individual components are quite interesting for this example. First, the circuit representation. So you have a quantum circuit that I can draw on a piece of paper, but how do I represent it as an input to my neural network? So here we decided to have a kind of three-dimensional input. It's two dimensions because qubit index and time, that's, well, space-time, so to speak, two dimensions. And then the third dimension is, so to speak, representing the class of the quantum gate. And in the end, only one of these bits will be highlighted that corresponds to the particular quantum gate that happens at this uh, space-time point. So you have this three-dimensional block with a few um, entries that are non-zero, and all of this three-dimensional block is fed as input into a neural network. Then what is the neural network doing? Well, we took one of those neural networks that are uh, popular in image processing, because we do have translational invariants in space and time. It doesn't really matter whether a gate is or a gate sequence is uh, sitting here or there, so that's a good uh, uh, that's a good uh, applic a domain of applicability for convolutional neural networks. And then we still have to talk about what's the output, yeah, what's the actions, and how we encode those actions. And then again, we have a three dimensional representation where we say, well, there's again the space time point, so that's two dimensions. And then as a third dimension we have our label, which transformation rule do we want to apply at this particular point in the circuit? And so this would be then our suggested action. And so the outcome of the neural network will be a probability distribution living on this three-dimensional um, block. And uh, what we will then try to do is to sample from this probability distribution and take one of those actions that have been assigned a high probability by the agent. And that corresponds to one of the transformations that we do. Okay, and as a small technical detail, the particular type of reinforcement learning we are applying uh, that is a um, is an um, actor critic method. So the neural network also puts out what it thinks is the value of the present state of the quantum circuit, whether it's already a pretty good circuit or not. Yeah, and then finally, the reward which we give is really what I already told you before, a reduction in the gate count or in the depth of the circuit, or maybe a combination of both. So this is the thing uh, that the um, agent wants to optimize. And so then uh, I have to come to training. So how do you train? How do you define the challenges? You could now think of uh, putting as uh, training challenges all the possible quantum algorithms there exist in the world, compiled for all possible uh, gate sets. And I don't know, maybe we will do that in the future, but that's a little bit a hard task. So what we did instead is we produced random circuits. So random circuits with the available gates. Then we shrink the circuit a little bit with some trivial transformations. You don't need a neural network for that in order to have a kind of benchmark. And then afterwards, in order to let the neural network really uh, have some early success story, so to speak, uh, we blow up the circuit by random transformations. And then this is, the neural, uh, this is the circuit that the neural network wants to shrink down. This has the advantage that it will first learn very easy transformations and only later it will become better and better and also be able to shrink down circuits that are already quite compact. Okay, so this is what happens during training. Random circuits that the neural network tries to shrink as much as possible. And so here are the results. So on the left-hand side, you see how, for example, the depth of the circuit shrinks 
the depth, the average depth of typical circuits, because we're training on many, uh, shrinks during the training progress. And then it, eventually it settles at some average value. And then for any given stage of the training, you can ask yourself, okay, what happens in a sequence of time during the sequence of transformations when I start with a very bad circuit and I apply my transformations and my death shrinks in the course of time and then eventually I settle down at some point. And you see that at the end of the training, so these orange uh, curves are what the agent really does. And it's pretty good. It mostly improves the circuit except for these small occasional glitches when it is maybe not so good. Okay. Now we wanted to compare the performance and one general optimization technique that uh, suggests itself for a comparison is simulated annealing. So basically you also try to optimize the reward by uh, first randomly trying out different transformations. And then eventually when you cool down in the simulated annealing, uh, giving preference to the giving preference to the uh, better, uh, to those uh, transformations that make the circuit better. And what you see here is that, yes, the reinforcement learning takes a week of training, so it's non-trivial, but once it's trained, it only takes two minutes per circuit and it works for arbitrary circuits. In contrast, if you use an optimization tool like simulated annealing, it has to work fresh for any given circuit and it takes one to three days per circuit in order to achieve uh, performance that is not even as good as the reinforcement learning agent. Okay, and then the most remarkable thing and that uh, we really like is once you have trained your agent on relatively smaller scale circuits, you can also use it for large scale circuits. That's the power of these convolutional neural networks. So if you have trained it, so to speak, on small images, you can also apply them to larger images. And there the advantage of the reinforcement learning agent with respect to simulated annealing is even, even uh, much larger. Okay. And so then finally, just uh, quickly, we also applied it to a real algorithm. So that would be max cut. So basically finding the ground state of a random frustrated Ising model. Um, there's a certain quantum algorithm, quantum approximate optimization algorithm for that, uh, which can be translated into particular sequence of gates. The details are not so important, but this is just the example we start from. And then uh, this is uh, the sequence before optimization, the circuit before optimization. And uh, what you have below is the uh, sequence after optimization. Now, maybe you find it slightly disappointing. That's only, I don't know, a 10% improvement, but you have to realize that this sequence is already composed of many subsequences, which have been optimized by humans. And so where the agent really shines is then at the interfaces between the subsequence where it figures out that this is not yet quite optimal. And so this is really good. This is an agent that has been trained on random circuits. If you deliberately train an agent that only specializes on this very particular circuit, then you can get even a slight uh, further improvement. But this involves transformation sequences, which are very, uh, very long and counterintuitive. Okay. And so then in future, uh, one of the things we certainly want to do is train on a full uh, data set of quantum circuits. So you would take a data set of algorithms, you would compile them for different gate sets, and then you could train the agent on those. Okay, so with that, I'm at the end of my talk. On this slide, I just want to put up some references. In particular, I want to point out that uh, if you want to have a little bit more overview of what I've been talking about, uh, check out the lecture notes, uh, Machine Learning for Quantum Devices on SciPost. Uh, and also I'm currently giving an advanced class on machine learning that's more on the mathematical side. Maybe if you're interested, uh, check this out as well. And then finally, uh, if you are a PhD student who is about to finish and really wants to do a postdoc in this kind of field, there are several postdoc positions uh, precisely in this reinforcement learning applied to quantum technologies, and that's within the context of the so-called Munich Quantum Valley Initiative. So please, if you're interested, approach me. Um, I am looking forward to your application. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Florian, for this very nice uh, lecture. Uh, and thanks for the advertisements. I'm really considering to apply after this talk, to be honest. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have some questions uh, a bit more technical regarding the second part. I will start with those. So uh, going to the adaptive uh, error correction method. 
uh, what would happen if you have two type of error uh, with the same rate? Could the network in principle find a good strategy or does it oscillate between both in uh, individually good strategies? Uh, okay, that's a very... Um, so the... Okay, so first of all, the goal here is of course always to be able to correct any arbitrary errors and maybe you need more qubits for that as we know already from the analysis of Shore et al. So the question is not so much if I have several possible noise sources or errors. Um, the question rather is uh, more general. So can we have different strategies? And the answer I would say is yes. As with any optimization problem, you could have different local minima. And this is especially relevant for the following question. So uh, this is currently done in computer simulations, but eventually we want to apply it, of course, to real world devices. Now we know in, in advance that the real world device is not quite exactly maybe what we think it is because it's not perfectly calibrated. And then one idea, one obvious idea we had would be to start from the strategy that has been obtained after doing reinforcement learning on the computer, then to apply the strategy on the real device, you see that the performance is not quite what you expected, and then do actual reinforcement learning on the real device. Uh, the slight catch is that these discrete strategies, um, if you change your parameters of the, if the parameters of the real device are only slightly different, I expect the strategy even to be robust and to be basically the same. But if you change the parameters ever more, there will come a point when you should switch into a completely different strategy. And that now may be complicated if uh, the old strategy is still a local minimum, like in a first order phase transition. And that could really happen. And that uh, would be a little bit of a downside. So then maybe we have to kick it out of the local minimum and see what happens. So yes, there could be several different strategies. I should also point out that even after a lot of training, some aspects of these strategies are maybe not completely optimized. They're not completely settled. Or if you were to run the training fresh on the, exactly the same problem with the same parameters, uh, you could uh, end up with different strategies. We, we haven't really explored this very much, but there are in indications that sometimes this happens. Okay, thank you. And um, to successfully train uh, the adaptive error correction network, how many rep repetitions do you typically need and how does the number of repetitions scale with the number of qubits? Uh, okay, so uh, we're talking here tens of thousands as the usual number. Um, we have no scaling yet with the number of qubits. So here this was all done on four and then later five or so qubits. Um, we have been working hard on, um, say, getting good performance. Uh, so then, uh, say, if you have only Clifford gates, you can, you can do things much more efficiently. So then you could simulate for 10 qubits. But there, the challenge then is really in the strategies that are being discovered. So um, uh, because the, even if you get rid of, or even if you somehow... Um, if you successfully overcome the exponential scaling of the simulations, there is still the exponential scaling of the number of strategies. And even though reinforcement learning is very powerful and to some extent offsets this, uh, it's still a challenge. So I cannot give you a scaling with the number of qubits, unfortunately. That's fine. Now moving to the, to the second part, um, the training on, on random circuits seems uh, uh, close to the idea of randomized uh, benchmarking. Is there a connection there and in, in, in the sense of maybe what can, what can be extracted by both methods? Uh, okay. Um, that's a very good thought that hasn't occurred to me yet. Um, now, of course, the, the ultimate... So here the ultimate goal is, of course, you start with something random and then you shrink it and then it's no longer random and it becomes very compact. In randomized benchmarking, this would certainly not be, <laughs> is, certainly not, uh, is certainly not your goal. Um, so, what, uh, so at the moment, it's not clear to me what uh, might be uh, the connection, except maybe I could say the following. If you 
So right now we we only make the circuits, uh, we try to make them as compact as possible. We, we count the gates and so on, we count the depth. Uh, to make it slightly more realistic, you could say, no, no, I have an error model. I know this gate is really bad and that gate is a little bit better and so on. So I can at least have an estimate of what will be the total cumulative error of a particular uh, circuit. And I then could even go to, to, to a real device. Yeah? I, I could run this on a real device and I run this random uh, sequence and see uh, how bad the device performs. And uh, then I can get a little bit closer to maybe the, uh, the conceptual ideas of randomized benchmarking, benchmarking because then on the real device, I would uh, slowly learn which are the good gates, which are the bad gates, when do I win a lot if I eliminate a gate and so on. So that could be actually useful, but it's not something that I've really thought about. Thank you. And then um, the training on on uh, on the small circuits scaling uh, to to largest circuits. Now you train first on a small circuit, then to large circuits. Uh, is this somehow connected to the properties of of entanglement into this complex system? Somehow building some analogies to, for instance, matrix product states where where uh, you know there is the area law and then you know there is little entanglement so that you can still simulate uh, large systems. Uh, okay, I would be careful. So the I think these circuits, which can be arbitrary um, um, quantum algorithms, uh, if you were to look at them on the quantum state level, they would carry arbitrary amounts of entanglement and so on. The trick why we don't get punished for that is of course that we assume you have already taken the quantum algorithm you like and you compiled it already into this quantum circuit and you know it's going to do what you want to do but it's only possibly inefficient so that's the only downside and then we are applying these transformations where we are absolutely certain they will not change the overall unitary so we never need to simulate anything we never need to worry about the entanglement that may be contained in the circuit so at the moment, I don't yet see a connection. Good. And uh, maybe to, to, to enter into the final questions, uh, let's go back to a bit of a more high level picture type of questions. So there is a couple. <laughs> the first one is, is there a way to quantify the advantage of using machine learning for a given, a given problem? Sometimes it seems that neural networks are used to solve problems that could also be solved by other means, such as in optimization type of problems. Uh, does a neural network always beat the best optimizer? Is there any AI uh, supremacy? Okay. Say? <laughs> uh, okay, very good question. Now one has to, one has to say the following. At the moment, the field is still in the beginning. So many of the both theory works and also first experimental works you encounter uh, will be a little bit proof of principles. And that goes especially for experimental works. So they will almost always be probably in a regime where maybe other techniques would have been equally good and maybe what they're doing on a small number of qubits anyway could be done on a pocket calculator. So, so you have to keep that into, uh, in mind in the the more proper question then to ask is, okay, what you're showing here in, on a small scale, can I imagine it to scale up? And can I imagine it to, to, to give me an advantage? Uh, now, when people then get more serious and uh, compare, uh, of course, you have to compare against um, optimization techniques. But as I showed a little bit in this case of simulated unhealing, uh, what these optimization techniques often lack is any kind of, so to speak, semantic understanding of the problem. They are just seeing this function of a million variables and trying to optimize it. You could argue that is also what a neural network is doing, and I would agree with you, but that's only during the training stage. And after that, the neural network has adapted to the particular high dimensional structure of the training examples or typical problem challenges that it's seeing. And it usually is very good into subdividing the task, so to speak. It looks at this high dimensional, I don't know, quantum state or quantum circuit or image, and it splits it into many pieces and it knows how to uh, attend to the different pieces. And this is something that if you just brute force run your standard optimization algorithm, uh, that will have no similar understanding of, of the problem. So I think this is what makes uh, what 
so what neural networks are really good at is look at high dimensional data and much of it and eventually conclude that some of the essence of it is rather a low dimensional problem. You could put it this way. Thank you very much. And uh, then maybe the, the last question also to ask you a bit of uh, your opinion. So you, you mentioned a bit uh, uh, about uh, quantum machine learning. So uh, uh, what is the role of quantum in quantum machine learning? And, yeah. and uh, more specifically, could one think about the possibility of using quantum computers to train complex neural networks? That is using quantum enhancement to train very complex neural networks? Okay, yeah, so quantum machine learning is of course a word that spans many different things. Um, I discussed one uh, relatively more simple thing where you say I have a quantum circuit that's parameterized and then in the same spirit as neural networks, I change the continuous parameters and then uh, there, there will be a quantum advantage in the sense if I run this on a real device and um, uh, if I have sufficiently many qubits, Maybe the calculation that my unitary is doing is so complicated that I could not be able, would not be able to run it on a classical device. So that's one thing where, so to speak, the input is quantum and the output is quantum. Now, one thing has to be said, um, when people think of machine learning and then get excited about maybe introducing quantum into the uh, game, um, machine learning, of course, you think of large amounts of data. And when you say large amounts of data, often you think of classical data. And there's the infamous bottleneck that um, people had invented already uh, some early, say linear algebra, quantum algorithms uh, to, to speed up these uh, components of machine learning. But then they realized, well, there's a bottleneck. If I want to try to get my classical data into the quantum device, and this bottleneck may completely uh, obliterate any advantage I got from the uh, from from doing further operations on the quantum device. So then the um, answer to that is a little bit maybe you should not work on large amounts of classical data. Uh, so you should um, either do say machine learning type of tasks acting on quantum data, which could be, say, a quantum many body system or results from a quantum simulator, but it's not measurement results, it's still the actual thing. And you work on that, that, uh, that, is, that is very reasonable. Or you uh, go into this direction of reinforcement learning and uh, say, well, my action sequences, I represent in a quantum fashion and uh, I do things like Grover search is the simplest example um, to try to accelerate my search for good action sequences. And there have been a couple of theory works on this and very recent experimental work, for example, with photonic circuits, first, first ideas. Um, but at the moment, these are still really on the toy model or proof of principle stage. Yeah, it, uh, At the moment, one does not uh, simply know how I would go and encode a, a realistic a reinforcement learning um, environment uh, into, into, such a, into such a quantum approach, uh, let alone keep intact the model free nature, because um, if I don't have a model of my environment, of course, I also cannot build a quantum version of the environment, which uh, for some of these approaches I actually would need because the environment becomes an oracle. So um, I guess it's extremely important and we should definitely study it. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, it's only at the beginning. Yeah, thank you so much, Farim. Uh, once more for the nice talk and for answering all these many questions that we got from the audience. So I'll now pass the mic to, to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you also from my side, Florian. This was a really inspiring and cool overview to, to see what's going on there really like the uh, circuit optimization at the end. Our next speaker, uh, by the way, will uh, be uh, Christine Zibberhorn on December 2nd. So again, we switch to a monthly schedule. So the next talk will be on December 2nd. If you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. You can subscribe to our email list, our Google Calendar, and you can follow us on Twitter. And with that, uh, you should also certainly check out our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow they'll have Bryce Gatway, who will speak about Hamiltonian engineering. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again on December 2nd. Same time, same place.
Bye.